Let's look first at the case of a negative externality. Or a third party cost. And I'll use as the example production of paper. Now, notice right away, paper is not a negative externality. Paper production causes a third party cost. The cost itself is pollution, water and air pollution. So keep that clear in your mind. Paper is not a negative externality. Paper is a good that people use a lot of. The negative externality caused by the production of paper is pollution. Okay. What does it mean to say that the market for the production of paper fails? Is a case of market failure. There are markets for paper. There's a price of paper. There's a supply curve for paper. And there's demand for paper. And a freely operating market, let's say M. So there we have an unregulated market for paper. What's so wrong with that? Well, the problem is that these third-party costs are not paid for. The, the paper firm doesn't pay a cost for dumping hot water back into the lake or river and killing the fish. And the consumer doesn't pay the cost either, because that cost is borne by people who are not producers or consumers of paper. It's neighbors of the paper mill pay those costs. So all that the firm sees, the marginal cost for producing paper, firms see, so to speak, because they pay, only the private cost of paper production. They have to buy the pulp, they have to employ the workers, they have to use the machinery, they have to have electricity and these sorts of things. But there's also, on top of that, some marginal X, X for external cost. For every ton, let's say this is tons per year, for every ton of paper produced, third parties are paying a cost in the form of pollution and lower property values and more dead fish and smellier air. So there's actually another cost curve here. Now these terms, marginal private costs, marginal external costs, marginal social costs, these are not uniform terms. You'll see them done differently in Manku and in other textbooks. The way I'm using it, marginal social cost is the sum of the private cost paid by the firm and the external cost paid by third parties. So society includes the producers of paper, the consumers of paper, and the neighbors of the paper mill. Way to see this is that the marginal external cost is the distance between these two curves. The black curve shows you how much the firm pays. The green curve shows you how much society pays. And just to keep things simple, I've drawn it as a constant amount that there's some constant cost to third parties of any 
ton of paper being produced. Probably not the case, but it keeps the graph a lot simpler. Okay, what does that mean? That means that if we consider social costs, if we consider both the private cost and the external cost of producing paper, then QO, the socially optimal amount of paper production, will be less than QM, the output produced by the market. QO is what we want as a society. QM is what we get. The market output is determined at the level of output where the marginal private cost is equal to the marginal benefit. That's what the demand curve tells us. The demand curve tells us that that's the marginal benefit. That's how much consumers are willing to pay for a marginal ton of paper. Where those two are equal, the market will produce, produce at QM. The socially optimal level of output, on the other hand, is where the marginal social cost is equal to the marginal benefit. Society wishes that output stopped at QO. And notice why exactly. Look at this triangle. Redraw my point M. Society wishes output were lower than QO. Why? Because look, for each of these units, between QM and QO, if you draw a vertical line. For each of those units, the social cost of producing that unit was greater than the benefit of consuming it. Therefore, these units from QO to QM, each of those units were produced by the market but shouldn't have been from society's point of view. The allocatively efficient level of output is QO and therefore as you may have surmised the triangle shows you the efficiency loss. That's the deadweight loss caused by the negative externality. So, what can we do about this? If QM is what we get, but QO is what we want, and the triangle of deadweight loss shows just how much efficiency is lost by the negative externality, if the government is going to intervene here, what's the government going to do? Just redraw that. Quantity of paper. Price of paper. Some demand curve for paper that shows us the benefit, how much consumers want it. some supply curve showing us the private cost of paper production. On top of it, the marginal social cost of paper production separated by the marginal external cost to third parties so that the social cost is the combined marginal private cost and marginal external cost of any unit of paper output. The unregulated market will produce here 
at QM. That's what we get from the market. What we want what's allocatively efficient is QO. So how can we get there? Well, one way to get there is by the use the government the government can do a lot of things. The government can, you know, shoot everyone who makes paper until output falls to QO. The government can put production limits and price floors and price ceilings. But one efficient thing a government can do is impose a Pigovian tax. It's called Pigovian because it was cooked up by Mr. Pigou, P-I-G-O-U. So it's called a Pigovian tax, where the government sets a tax approximately equal to the marginal external cost of paper production. Now, notice this is in fact a tricky nut to crack. Epistemologically, it's hard to know how much people suffer from fish dying in the lake. How much do people suffer if the air smells funny because there's a paper mill? But, just to keep things simple, let's assume that the government can in fact measure this. If it does so, that then the imposition, this is a per unit per unit tax on the sellers, or even that's not so precise because the consumers will pay it, some of it too. So let's just say it's a, a per unit tax. What it does is that it causes the firm's cost curve to float up, so to speak. We've raised the private cost. This is called internalizing the externality. The Pigovian tax internalizes the negative externality by making the firm see it by making the firm pay it. The government says, okay, every time you dump a ton of hot water into the lake, or more precisely, every time you produce a ton of paper, you are going to pay a tax that you didn't used to pay. Well, if the firm is now paying a tax that it didn't used to pay, it's facing a new supply curve. If the firm now faces a new supply curve, and that supply curve corresponds to the marginal private cost plus the tax, if, this is a big if, but if the government has calculated it just right, and if the tax is the same size as the external cost, then the firm will now, producers, will now produce at M2 because that's where their costs, MPC plus T, are equal to marginal benefit, what consumers are willing to pay. Now for QM2 is equal to QO. Now firms will pay the excuse me, produce the allocatively efficient level of output. What had been a deadweight loss is removed because the imposition of the tax has convinced firms to lower output from QM to QO. That's how the government can use a Pigovian tax to internalize the externality get rid of the deadweight loss and move us from QM to QO. Still leaves the question of how the government can deal with a positive externality such as that created by health care. Let's take a look at that.